Welcome back to the PFN Dallas Cowboys podcast, episode three. I'm Jess Tavares alongside Dalton Miller, my fantastic, amazing, incredible, all the great like adjectives of a co-host with this podcast. Dalton, how was your week since we last chatted? Uh, you know, it's been up and down. Uh, we we went through. We lost internet at the house in Pennsylvania, so I took the trip down to Ocean City, Maryland, uh, to have internet for the last couple of days. Hopefully, we get that settled so I can get back into uh, Mikasa. But uh, you know, other than that, we're we're doing okay. I've been been going out on the boat a little bit, caught a couple fish, no keepers, but you know, it's it's nice and relaxing out on the water. So it's it's been good. I love that. And you know what I love is we have a staff meeting every week and we all come together as uh, as a staff where Dalton has his camera off and then all of a sudden he turns it on. He's just straight on a boat. Like mm-hmm. Dalton is that guy in the staff meeting that is just like fully working from home on a boat. And I just, I need that energy. Moment. I think it was, I think it was like two and a half. It was, it was like two or three years ago um, when we were doing like daily meetings and it was over the summer. And I was on uh, a my same boat or a different boat, but you know, our, our boat, uh, we were on vacation and I joined the meeting and they were like, see this, this is an example of the work life balance that we are trying to bring the PFN. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's, that's a good way to look at it. It was the definition work from home moment. I mean, look, if you catch me out at the pool at my apartment, some days at the meeting, who knows, you know, work from home is amazing and we love it, but What we don't love is there's some injuries that we'd have to talk about here on the podcast today um, because it impacts a lot of things. But I do want to go and I want to start the podcast off by addressing it because for me, it's it weighs heavy on my heart when you see these guys go out with injuries at any point in time, especially when it's a season ending injury. It's just it's gutting really for any player. But I think with these specific guys, with DeMarvian Overshone and John Stevens Jr., who are going to be out for the season with ACL injuries, it's extremely, extremely heartbreaking. And it is gutting because I really feel for them. I feel like they didn't get the opportunity to really do much. They didn't get the opportunity to show anything that they had. They were barely turning on the road to get started. So um, Dalton, obviously you were watching the game. You saw the same things as I did. How are you feeling about both of these guys? And I mean, really, it's just devastating to see them not get started yet. Yeah, so it's it's always tough to see injuries. The preseason sucks for that reason and, and pretty much that reason alone. Uh, but I, I think, and I hate to say this, but it's the business that we are in. Um, injuries for the Dallas Cowboys, particularly, I think, with John Stevens, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing for the team that that happened to him because there is that battle at the tight end position because he was flashing and making things incredibly difficult to, to kind of figure out who they are going to keep that position. They have the injury. Now they can stash him on injured reserve for the entire season while he recovers from that ACL, try to develop him and bring him back next season and see how he has progressed. So injuries are terrible. They always are. But in this specific situation for the team in the long run, it might be a good thing because of the log jam that they had at the position. In DeMarvian Overshone's case, it's a little bit different because you needed that guy on special teams. You needed that guy as a third linebacker. And, you know, maybe Devin Harper or Orge Brocox are going to be able to figure that position out at, at that third linebacker spot. But for me, he was going to end up being the guy. He was having a fantastic camp. He was be looking fantastic in the preseason. So that one, I, I think, hurts this football team a lot more, obviously, this season because you didn't expect much out of John Stevens, even if he did make the team. But I I think when you really look back on it, that's the injury out of the two that that hurts the Cowboys for this season. Yeah, I think with DeMarvian, you even just look at his story and his background coming from such a small town and the odds of him even being an NFL player were so stacked against him. He finally makes it, he gets his chance, and then this injury occurs. I, I've i just been gutted for him all weekend. I, mm-hmm. I was uh, hanging out with my parents, and I would just be sitting there thinking about it. I'd be like, oh, man, poor Demo. Like, I just... I have not been able to shake the feeling of what he could have done this year if 
this had to happen because we were seeing glimmers of it. So no doubt that he's going to attack this rehab process like he's attacked this offseason, which is with grace, with dignity, and with the perseverance that has gotten him to this point in his career so far. I really liked his Instagram post afterwards where he talked about he's still blessed. And, you know, I I think his attitude and mentality even post-injury is saying a lot of how he's going to – uh, take that mentality into his rehab. So no doubt he's going to come out stronger. It's just in the meantime, this sucks. It, it sucks for him. It sucks for really the entire group because everybody was rooting for him. He was the guy uh, at the in the pregame huddle before, um, I remember it was the Jacksonville game. He was amping everybody up. So you're talking about a future leader of this team is, is what he was on track for. And so... I, I think when Mike McCarthy had a, a conference call yesterday, I was on there and he was talking about how, frankly, you could make the argument that DeMarvian Overshone is the star of the rookie class. And so it just hits really hard. But um, he said he really hopes that these guys can take something from this and learn in the bigger picture of, of how to grow and, and be better. So um, wishing them all the best. Um, during that conference call, we got a couple of other updates as well that I wanted to make sure to mention because they are important and they do create kind of a ripple effect, uh, if you will. So he talked about Matt Willetsko and he said that he's kind of day to day by now that um, we're recording this on Tuesday. So the the Cowboys are back at the star for training camp that he would be with Britt and um, that they're kind of just seeing what he could do. And so as far as that, there's that. And then Ronald Jones, who was asked about Rojo as well. And he said, Rojo is, you know, kind of, Hard pressed to play this weekend, although he said Matt Let's Go had a chance to possibly play this weekend. He was very adamant that he's hard pressed to say that Rojo would be ready. So if you read between the lines, SOS, uh, something's got to give. I, I think Matt Let's Go's kind of, you know, the the ripple effect goes into play. I think with Rojo, the running back room so stacked that it's it's not much of uh, really anything. But what do they do at this point, Dalton? I mean, really, it's it's already a very concerning room with the, with what we've seen with the depth within preseason and within camp. What do you do if you are the Dallas Cowboys front office, you're making all of the rules and you are making all of the calls. What are you doing with this O-line situation? Uh, It's, it's a tough situation because when you look at the depth on this team, it's, it's definitely lacking at this moment. It looks like, you know, from what I saw, on Twitter, uh, Brian Broadus from 105.3 The Fan was was bringing this up and, and answering some questions, saying that he doesn't think that the Jason Peters thing is going to happen for the Dallas Cowboys again this season. And, you know, from a playing perspective, I can see that because there are some young guys that they want to get reps on the outside there. But I think having that veteran presence to come in and kind of mold these guys, I, I think would be huge for the Dallas Cowboys. So it's a tough situation because you want to have more depth there, especially because of of the two guys that you're going to start on the outside are Tyron Smith and Terrence Steele. And Tyron Smith obviously has a long track record of not remaining healthy. And then Terrence Steele is coming off of the ACL, obviously. So it's going to be a difficult situation no matter what. O-line depth just throughout the league is not good. There aren't as many freakish athletes that, continue through on the offensive side of the ball because they can make more money on the defensive side of the ball. They can make more of a physical impact on that side of the ball. So you're just seeing the athletic differences between the offensive side and the defensive side. So I think that you're just kind of screwed either way, which is tough to say, but it's the truth. And I think that you can do things schematically to lessen the burden on that offensive line and on Dak Prescott. And I think that that, really is going to be the biggest thing from going from Kellen Moore, who really liked to play over the intermediate levels of the field. I think you're going to get a lot more quick game concepts this year, get the ball out of Dak Prescott's hands very quickly, and then take shots down the sideline this year instead of trying to open up the middle uh, with seam routes, uh, you know, running safeties off and and trying to hit digs over the middle of the field. So I think uh, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to them just figuring this out schematically with a somewhat compromised offensive line. And I think that's a really great point because yeah, Jason Peters, as soon as this happened and everybody was like, well, Jason Peters is available. In fact, he just said that he wants to play again this season and he's the, he's 
the fix that makes the most sense, right? But you also have to take a step back and think of things as far as contract situations, salary cap, and how much they are able to pay somebody right now to come in. Because let's not forget, there's three main guys, actually you can argue four, that need to be paid. You have Dak Prescott, CeeDee Lamb, Micah Parsons, and then you have Tyler Biotish, who's also on his contract here, that I think has just done an incredible job at the center position there. But there's four big contracts that you kind of have to look at. And of course you can prioritize them as you want to. I think that one's kind of up to discretion on who should get paid first and what have you. However, I, I don't know how much room they have to give. And especially with Zach Martin's money, especially with the guaranteed money that Jaron Curse is getting now, there's just been a lot of movement with contracts and um, Malik Hooker getting his deal. I don't know how much they have to give up at this point. And so I think as ter in terms of money, I don't know if they can swing it. However, if they are able to, you saw what Jason Peters could do for Tyler Smith last season. And I think he would be a really good guy to bring in again for all of the younger guys on this group because he has just really, really helped build the foundation for Jason P or for uh, Tyler Smith, excuse me. And he could do that for these younger guys. But overall, um, what was interesting is when Mike McCarthy was asked about the depth within the O-line and the linebacker room. He was asked about both of them. And with the linebacker room, he was very adamant of, we're trusting our young guys, uh, Devin Harper, Jabril Cox, and Tyrus Wheat. He, he really said, we're trusting these young guys here. This is their opportunity to step up. Very much like you said, Dalton, it's the nature of the business. When somebody goes down, the next guy's up. However, with the O-line, he wasn't as adamant about that. He just kind of said, we trust our guys. Let's see what happens. So when you read between the lines of the difference in responses, trust me, I listened to them back multiple times to make sure I wasn't just overanalyzing what he was saying. It, it seems like there's some concern there. So with him in the O-line, it said, you know, it basically reading between the lines, it was like, let's see what happens this week. And I think that's really all you can do. And I think there might be an opportunity to give Monty Osmond Fort and the Arizona Cardinals a call because Josh uh, Jones is somebody who has played offensive tackle and offensive guard for the Arizona Cardinals over the last couple of years is on the final year of his deal. And Monty Osmond Fort is down there in Arizona embracing the rebuild and just acquiring draft picks. So if they can, you know, add another day three draft pick for somebody like Josh Jones and bring him in to compete. I think that that's a, a pretty nice deal. Uh, it, that's somebody to look for. I think getting eyes, more eyes on Asim Richards at left tackle, left guard, see how he might be able to uh, end up possibly being that kind of swing guy, somebody who can play multiple positions. Even as a rookie, I, I think that he's looked pretty good in these first two preseason games. Some of these guys on the interior have, worried me a, a little bit especially against seattle's uh defensive line but i think at the end of the day like i said schematically i think they'll be able to figure out ways to make things easier on that offensive line yeah and i think for mike mccarthy i mean let's let's face it not even just for the cowboys you look around the league everybody's kind of getting ready for week one of the regular season at this point yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not really like they're getting ready for the raiders game on saturday and all be all no he did say his his focus right now within the offensive line is getting all of his starting guys back in the same unit for the first time since Zach Martin's return. Now that he's kind of ramped up a little bit, he can get in there and they can all kind of start growing that continuity and cohesiveness together. So he did mention that that's kind of top priority right now. So to me, they're worried about it. Yes, but they're not as worried about it as we are on, yeah. on this type of things. And uh, somebody that I wanted to make sure to mention was TJ Bass and what a great game he mm -hmm. had because his blocking abilities. I mean, I was curious and I was so thankful for Matt Owen for tweeting this out. So I didn't have to go look it up. But according to PFF, um, within the top five pass blocking grades against the Seahawks, you had this was surprising me a Josh Ball who got a grade of 86.5. You had TJ Bass in, in second, who had 82.4. And then you see a little bit of a drop-off because um, three through five in, in these top five didn't have a lot of pass pro snaps. You had Rico Dowdle uh, with a grade of 77.6, Malik Davis with 77.2. And if that doesn't give you uh, an indication how close that competition is, I don't know what will. Uh, and then you had Alec Lindstrom at 75.9. But all that to say, TJ Bass had a phenomenal game. I think he's great with his hands. He he does good work with his hands. It's just there's a lot of shoring up that needs to be done. But I saw some great things from him that 
it gives me some hope there, but yeah, well, let's go going out. Um, it just adds another layer of complication to an already complicated situation. So there's that as far as the linebacker group, like you had mentioned, um, that I don't really think that's a competition at this point. I kind of think it's just, Hey, who has the better week? I, I, I mean, really with your linebackers and you have Damone Clark, who's uh, clearly ready to go. You have LVE who wears the green dot. He's kind of the commander uh, of that group. So really I, I don't see them going with the wrong choice at this point. It's just, I wish it was overshown because man, uh, what, what, how fun would that have been to watch him uh, throughout the season? But you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that his rehab goes well and all of that. So Let's divert a little bit because um, we'll talk a little bit of offense and we'll switch to defense because I know you are dying to give us your hot or not take of the week. But let's go into kind of how this affects the run game because the running back competition, it's still a competition given we pretty much know Deuce Vaughn has a spot on this roster. However, you were adamant last week that he is your running back too. I was a little less adamant that, hey, maybe he's not your two, but he's on the roster somehow. After this week, do you still feel the same that Deuce Vaughn is your running back too? And if you're making the final roster projection, how many running backs do you keep? And who are those running backs within your projection right now? Listen, Deuce is my RB2, okay? The Dallas Cowboys RB2 is Rico Dowdle. Uh, I don't think that there's much conversation about it. It's It's been a great competition. I think that Malik Davis could come in and be an efficient running back as well. As long as the blocking is good, I think that he could do it. He's a big, powerful runner with good long speed, and he could create some explosive plays. But I think the way that Rico Dowdle runs and the way that Mike McCarthy speaks about Rico Dowdle and how he has looked when he has been healthy and he has been healthy this year so far – I think shows that he is going to be the guy that is their RB two, And then you're going to see, you know, four five, six carries a game for your very, very small running back. And he might catch some passes and get into the screen game a little bit. But I think that Rico Dowdle will be that number two guy for the Dallas Cowboys. I agree completely. I've been on this Rico Dowdle train since minicamp and OTAs. When I saw him for the first time, I kid you not, it was at minicamp. I saw somebody just speeding by. I was like, who the hell was that? Like, who's running like that? And then I look, I'm like, it's Rico Dowdle. Oh, man, he looks good. So after that, I started catching up with him more and more in the locker room. And during this offseason, I've been really lucky to talk to him a lot. He's somebody that I've really picked his brain with um, because I haven't had the opportunity to. And just the way he viewed this opportunity, even starting minicamp and OTAs, even well before that, kind of. When the writing was on the wall with Zeke, he saw this as an opportunity that he hasn't had in the last four years. He's healthier than he's ever been is what he says. He feels better than he's ever been. He's doing different things to really focus on the the downfalls of his body, if you will, that have not been good to him. So more muscular, uh, more soft tissue kind of things that he's focusing on uh, when he's rehabbing and even after practice with ice baths and doing little things to ensure that his body stays healthy. What I loved is when Mike McCarthy at, was asked about him in his uh, conference call, he was, he said, I love his running style. He plays with energy or he plays angry. He has pass protection with a lot of urgency. He sticks his nose in there. Um, and of course he was asked about the punt pro because we saw the non block uh, is what I'm going to call it uh, during the game. And he said that he's not worried about that. The, Usually Rico is very good with the pump pro as well. And so he said, you know, it just kind of happened, but it's something he can learn from what sticks out to me the most about Rico is after the game, uh, the first game against the Jaguars, I was there, I went to go talk to him immediately after like, how do you feel? And it was really cool because he was, well, he was really down about the fumble on the one yard line. Obviously it's like, I could have done without that fumble, not happy about it. And I said, okay, we'll go get a touchdown next week. So I'm very excited to catch back up with Rico to be like, how did that touchdown feel? Because it always seems like he's trying to strive for something better. So I guarantee you his response will be something like, I want more. You know, it's he's hungry. He's coachable. I agree. I think you're going to see some spe special packages for Deuce Vaughn because there's no way he's not a part of this roster. There's just not a multiverse where that exists, really. Um, and 
I also think you needed a guy uh, when Noah Brown left to take that special teams place. You needed somebody who could kind of be a backup to Kevontae Turpin. And now that he's getting more integrated into the offense, who knows? Maybe you can have both of them. Maybe you take a one-two punch approach with that punt returner position. So you keep the longevity of their bodies, you know, there, especially for Kevontae Turpin, who's going to get more involved in the offense. So I think if you have that option, use it. It kind of puts uh, the pressure on Kevontae Turpin to really play his best ball when you know you got a guy ready to go behind you and do spawn. So, yeah, I think you get three. You get Tony Pollard, Rico Dowdle, do spawn. But overall, um, it's it's exciting. It's really exciting to see how this competition is shaping up. So let's kind of go to tight ends now. Because with John Stevens Jr. out of the competition, out of this mix, uh, as he's out for the season as well, this is interesting because he was a guy that was really making people talk about taking veterans' positions. And when a rookie can come in and do that, it says a lot about the rookie, but it also tells the veteran, hey, time to step up, man. Light the fire and and step it up. So for me, somebody I'm really going to be focused on this week is Peyton Hendershot. Because is it safe to say he has a spot on this roster? He hasn't had the most impressive camp. He's kind of blended in. And I hate to say that because he has moments of greatness. But I think this week was really the first week that I was like, oh, there's Peyton and he's blocking. He's doing a great job at blocking today. Where are you with Peyton Hendershot right now? Well, I think the Cowboys are in a pretty decent position because I, I think at the when this is all said and done, we're probably going to end up with four tight ends and three running backs, so they're going to be able to keep all four. But if things are a little bit different, you have to look at that foot for Luke, and I know that it, he is okay overall, but that is a an injury that can linger. And when an injury can linger like that, if they don't think a guy is going to be ready to come in and compete for significant snaps in year one, he, that injury might flare back up after this last preseason game and he might end up on IR so they don't actually have to cut Peyton Hendershot. That's the tricks that the uh, NFL likes to play to get guys to stay on the roster when they want to develop them in the shadows. And that's something that could happen with Luke. It, it would be unfortunate because when we look at this rookie group overall, who is going to produce as a rookie this year? And, and you look at it and Mozzie Smith, who we're going to talk about, doesn't look ready right now. You look at the second round pick. Luke doesn't look like he's going to start or be the second guy even in that rotation. So it is going to be interesting to see how this all shakes down eventually, but I think they're going to end up with three guys uh, at wide receiver or at running back and, and four at tight end, unless Shun's foot flares back up. Yeah, that's that's kind of been my, my thing the whole time is you have four horsemen, not just three anymore. And that's because Sean McEwen has made it really hard to not talk about him during the camp. He hasn't really shown out during the preseason games, but I know the work has been there. He's obviously worked with Dak this offseason. Both him and Jake have taken that initiative to work with Dak in the offseason, build that chemistry. Um, and, and what I love about that Dak yard and, or the fortress, whatever you want to call it. It's the Dak it, yard. He could call it the fortress all he wants. We've named it for It's him. the Dak yard. We know the truth. We know the truth over here on the PFN Dallas Cowboys podcast. We know. Um, but I, I think um, that allowed them to get their mistakes out early in that in that on that field where nobody sees it. And Dak's talked about this. That's where the guys can shake off the rust, get everything out, you know, learn. And then that's why they've come out and had good camps. That's why Jake Ferguson had a great camp. And, you know, maybe he wasn't like always the flashiest guy, but then he comes out in preseason game one and just looks like a baby Travis Kelsey out there. So again, all of that offseason work is really paying dividends for, I think, both of them. Um, Schoon has the mentality and he fits the mold of that tight end room. I mean, they all look like clones when they're standing next to each other with their pads and helmet on, they look like clones. And the only reason you can tell Jake Ferguson apart is he has his leg tattoo. He has a whole leg sleeve. Um, and so I think Schoon with, with the time he kind of missed, you're going to see a little bit of a later progression, but I think it's still there as long as it's not uh, a worse injury, as long as it doesn't turn into a worse injury uh, with that kind of tear on his foot. As for Peyton, 
I really think it's a confidence game for him. And we've seen, and, and I'm so glad that this has come up within this offseason, how much confidence matters for these guys. I think with him, it's a matter of building up that confidence to take that jump. But I have no doubt that once that confidence is built, you're going to see Peyton Hendershot in year two mode, which is scary for anybody that has to go against him. I just think right now he needs to build it and he needs to find it within himself to take that jump and take the confidence and and know you're here for a reason. You're that guy and you're going to continue to be that guy as long as you want to be. So um, yeah, I, I'm excited for this, this tight end room. Just it, it energizes me. I get so excited uh, talking about them, but let's switch courses. Let's talk defense. Um, Let's start with your hot or not take. Let's start there because there's a lot I want to unpack on that too. Just so you guys know, I see this hot or not take kind of right before we record. So he gets my raw reactions of what I actually think about it. So I would just love to throw that out there. Dalton, what is your hot or not take for the week? Sam Williams will have the second most sacks on the Dallas Cowboys in 2023. And that will be in the double digit range. Yes, Sam Williams will have 10 plus sacks in 2023. I was speechless. I was speechless. Uh, I couldn't find my mute button. If you is it is it hot or not? That's all that matters. Is it hot or is it not? You're more than welcome to disagree with me. There are, I mean, listen, when you look at this defensive line, you have Dorrance Armstrong, who I believe had eight and a half sacks last year. You have Demarcus Lawrence, who tank, you know, the sack numbers haven't really been there recently, but he has the ability to be a 10 plus sack guy. And then Dante Fowler has continued to be productive for the Dallas Cowboys on the edge. I just think that Sam Williams with Dan Quinn's ability to dial up pressure with his explosiveness, his athleticism and his incredible motor. I think he's going to have the opportunities to when it's not Micah Parsons breaking the sack record. It's going to be Sam Williams coming in and and cleaning things up for the uh, Dallas Cowboys defensive line on the edge. Well, I'm glad we can agree that Michael Parsons is going to be the sack leader. Yeah, yeah, period. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's that. That that's obvious. Um, I I want to say hot because I'm really rooting for Sam, but I'm gonna say not for right now, only because we haven't seen him in like full regular season game mode with a starting defense. Let me see him with the starting defense, blend that in, and then I can tell you if it's an actual hot or not take for me. For me right now, I haven't seen enough of him to say that. I think there's a lot of things that, um, as far as is his reactiveness, that I think he kind of needs to work on a little bit. I think Sam is just very emotionally charged, and you saw that very much so in the little scrambles that, or scrums that you saw at camp. But I think he has it in him. I do. I think he's going to be one of the top sack leaders. But Dorrance Armstrong, I mean, guy's just a sack monster. Like, Dorrance Armstrong is just going to Dorrance Armstrong. However, however, I'm going to say it's a not for now. Talk to me week well, after week one when we record this episode. We'll reconvene on this conversation. I'm going to say it's a not for now only because Dorrance Armstrong's in the equation. I haven't seen Sam full game mode just yet. However... Sam Williams is a beast. Can we talk about how quick he is? And what I really liked about him was something that needed work was his hands. And then the very next day at practice, when they were back in Oxnard, he's working with Micah Parsons on his hands. So if anyone's going to teach you to get better, Micah Parsons. Another guy that we wanted to talk about, Mozzie Smith. We talked about this last week, but I wanted to kind of get back in this conversation because it's still a conversation worth mentioning. You mentioned earlier, you don't think he's quite ready. What does he have to do at this point to kind of shore things up to take that step to be ready? And and do you see him being able to do that this week alone or the next couple of weeks, I guess, ahead of week one? I don't see him being able to do it this season. Um, he is just so far behind where he needs to be to be a consistent player at the NFL level. I still think that we can see the flashes from him every once in a while. You're going to get an an opportunity where he's able to pin his ears back. He actually gets off the ball in time and he's able to just go after the quarterback. I think that's where you're going to see him kind of shine uh, when he gets his snaps this year. But I think from a down to down consistency perspective, he just doesn't have it right now. And it just comes with the territory of being a true, you know, one tech at the college level 
being a two gap guy now you're in more of a gap and a half scheme you're being you know you're asked to attack a little bit more often you're not confident in what you are doing and that's the biggest thing for me that i've seen from him it's not that he is a little bit late off the ball because he is a little bit late off the ball but when i look at him i see somebody who isn't confident in what he's being asked to do right now and i think when you have to process things and you have that gap and a half responsibility there's times where you know you just can't get reached if you're a two eye and they run outside zone you can't get reached by the center and it's that laid off the snap it's the you know lack of confidence that he has in what he is doing out there and it just comes with time i said this a million times at this point but playing defensive tackle in the nfl is incredibly more cerebral than people think it is they think that it's just 300 pound dudes who are really strong and sometimes super athletic but it's so much more than that because if you lose positional leverage at all if you are a little bit high you're going to get blown off of the ball it doesn't matter if they have to add length to the weight rack of your rotational force thing in michigan and you can push 700 pounds with it If you are out of position, an NFL player is going to make you pay for it. And that's what we are seeing with him right now. I still think that in the long run, Mozzie Smith is going to be absolutely fine. This is a great coaching staff. He will be okay, but it's going to take time. And it's a good thing they don't necessarily need him early on. I also want to mention, too, and Aisha Morrison brought this up uh, when we recorded Girls Talk, Boys Talk, is Jonathan Hankins, who is a veteran player in this game, talked about you know his conversation with her she said that he mentioned how long it took him to be able to to adjust Mm -hmm. to the scheme within the defense dan quinn's defense on the dallas cowboys so it's not an easy task to do something that i love that mike mccarthy mentioned that conference call was guys he's a rookie too right and and i think that's what people forget when you're a first round draft pick is you're still a rookie and look sometimes guys just they, they're not going to step in and get it right away. What he's being asked to do is a very complicated, difficult task. And it's it's not the end of the world. It's good. He has a long career ahead of him. And when he gets it, he's going to get it. And it's going to click. And you're going to see that. Until then, that is a confidence thing. And I think people forget that this is a job for them too, right? When you start a new job, it's not always very easy. It can be very overwhelming. And it can sometimes just feel like, you know, am I really good at this? Did I really get this job? Because I thought I was good at this and now I got this job and I'm not sure. It's the same thing. And we forget that because they're football players, but it's really the same thing. I mean, even starting this job, uh, my first couple of weeks, I was like, what did I just sign up into? This is crazy. This is a lot. But the more confident you get within time, because you're understanding, uh, you know, the understanding of what you're supposed to be doing. Same thing for Mozzie Smith. I think you know, at some point, people have to just give him that grace to understand he's a rookie and he is young. He's 22 years old. We looked this up on Girls Talk Boys Talk, 22 years old. And I look at what I was doing at 22 years old. It was not memorizing a Dan Quinn defensive scheme. I'll tell you right now, that is not what I was doing. Um, but yeah, I, I think Mozzie Smith will be ready at some point. And when he's ready, that's great. But I think in the meantime, too, we just haven't seen enough action of him working next to Jonathan Hankins either. I think Jonathan Hankins is going to be a really good, uh, I guess, mentor for him. And I think it's tough when looking at this because the fans will turn on him. They will. It's just it is what it is. Uh, They turned on Jalen Tolbert the year before. And look at Jalen now. Look at, you know, he's, he's gotten his confidence back. He is playing freely. And I think the same thing is going to happen with Mozzie Smith in the future as well. I think that there have been times like with the Taco Charlton pick where you just knew it wasn't going to work out. The guy just didn't have it. That's not what we're seeing with Mozzie Smith. And when we look at the, the even the most recent history of defensive tackles that have been drafted, I mean, look at Dexter Lawrence. Dexter Lawrence didn't really come on until year three. You look at Quinn and Williams. Quinn and Williams didn't really come on until year three. Jeffrey Simmons is one of those guys who did you know, come out right away. But Jordan Davis, another guy drafted very highly and did not look good and has not looked good this preseason either. Nose tackle position is very, very difficult to play. And you need to give these guys a little grace and let them learn as they go because it's going to take time for them. Yeah. Give them grace, people. Don't be bad fans, period. Be nice fans, right? That's, I mean, 
anyways, look, I could go on a whole rant about that, but I won't. Let's switch gears. I want to talk to you about the regular season is weeks away at this point, which is crazy. We're in pumpkin season. We're almost in regular football season. I mean, lots going on. There's a lot of seasons going on at once, but it's the best season. Let's let's call it what it is. It's the best. Are you a pumpkin do, do, guy? Do you, I was going to ask you, do you have to be in line for the day the pumpkin, the PSL comes out? At Starbucks. It's on Thursday, and I'm planning on it. Absolutely, absolutely. I have to be at the start. You no, know, Duncan's Thursday. already got them. Duncan's I, already got them. Did you? I already got that. I okay, already got that. Already um, okay. Yeah, I got that at the airport. Uh, when what I did you to think? This weekend. What did you um, think? Look, I'm not a Duncan gal. I'm what gonna be fair, honest. Uh, Dutch Bros is my my choice if I have one. There's not one near me um, here in Frisco, so I have to drive a little bit to go get it. But it's worth it. Look, I will get anything pumpkin. I'll try it at least once, but I guarantee you, I'm not going to hate it. If it has pumpkin, I'm just not going to hate it. Are you a pumpkin guy? This is a really I, so integral I'm not a, part. I'm, of I'm not a huge coffee. pumpkin guy. I'm not a good. I'm not a big like flavored coffee guy. I drink my coffee black. I have an espresso. It's fantastic. Oh, uh, okay. No, no, no. Nespresso coffee is different. The European coffee is different. I'm, I'm telling you. But when we're talking about just pure pumpkin stuff, pumpkin seeds, uh, pumpkin pie, delicious fantastic i love the fall it's my favorite season it's one of the reasons why i cover football oh man i'm so glad you agree pumpkin pie is delicious is that the elite pie in your choice no it's not the elite pie in my choice um cheesecake is technically in my eyes a pie so cheesecake is number one for me it's got a pie crust it's got a pie crust i don't care if it's a cheesecake i actually think that it's its own entity but i i think (laughs) if we had to put it in cake or pie it's pie it's pie. It should be called cheese pie. Like, let's call it what it is. It should be a cheese pie. I agree. Um, oh, my goodness. We we have so much more in common um, today, and I'm really walking out of this feeling great. Uh, greater than I did about this podcast with somebody who can agree it's a pie. Um, but I want to ask you, going into the start of the regular season, what needs to be done for you this week to feel good, to feel confident? I know you already feel good, but feel fully confident going into week one. What do you need to see from whether it be specific position groups or guys, schematics? What do you want to see this week? The only thing I need to see is a healthy Dak Prescott and a healthy offensive line heading into week one. That's it. I'm I'm confident if those two things are the truth when we, I say we, I shouldn't say we, when the Dallas Cowboys play the New York Giants in week one. That's, that's a great it. point. No, that's a great point. I, and I, I look, I agree with Mike McCarthy and not playing the starters in the preseason. I'm all for it. I'm all here's, for it. Yeah. Here's the thing. I, and I would like to get in on this discussion very quickly because I'm very adamant about this. No, that I will take our starters being rusty for the first two weeks of the season over potentially having Dak Prescott do a, pull a Tony Romo against Seattle and be out for the season, and then the season is ruined. So, yes, I will take a couple weeks of an offense that doesn't look all that great to have your starting quarterback, the most important position in the NFL and in all of professional sports, to be healthy. That's it. Period. Mic drop. Look. You said it. I I would I I'm all for it. I think it makes sense. I th- I don't I don't I don't know. I I'm glad Mike McCarthy is very adamant about I it. Wanted to, I wanted to I wanted to cry watching Josh Allen the other day. I wanted to cry watching Josh yeah. Allen the other day because he just these guys they're so competitive and you need to be to get to that level. There's no off switch. You you can't turn Josh Allen off. He's going to want to run you over. And that's something that he obviously has t- spoken about publicly that he needs to fix. But like Dak Prescott is that same type of competitor. So I don't want Dak Prescott out there. I don't want Tyron out there. I, don't, I never want to see him take a preseason snap. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that it's good what Mike McCarthy does with the starters on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah, I don't want to see any of them. I don't want to see any. And, you know, that brings me to my conversation. What I need to go into feeling confident I don't want to see Jalen Tolbert on the field. I don't want to see Deuce Vaughn on the field. I really don't even want to see Rico Dowdle on the field this week. I think they're good. I think they've had complete uh, – they've showed you what they need, right? Mm-hmm. I think Rico Dowdle could have a, pl- a complete game if he were to play. I don't want to know. I don't want to see it. I don't want to risk any injury uh, at this point to any of those guys. And I think 
this last week was a good reminder of, hey, injuries can happen at any point in football, whether it's preseason or regular season, and it can change course of what you think your team could be. And look, I'm not saying like losing John Stevens Jr. and DeMarvin Overshone are like our end all, end all be all, but I do think they're they're big losses. And I, I, we can go back into that discussion anytime, any day. Cause I'm really gutted by them. I, I really have lost sleep over this, this weekend. I'm, I feel horrible for them. Um, but I do think if you're talking about your starting quarterback, why, why would any of them be on the field this week? Um, no, I, I think for me to feel confident this last week of training camp, this last week of preseason sit your starters and Mike McCarthy was very adamant about we don't know what the game plan is yet they don't really do that until Thursday so he said we're kind of going to see what happens this week and then we'll go accordingly I don't see any of the starters playing but for me I don't want to see Jalen Tilbert, Deuce Vaughn or Rico Dowdle on the field at all Kevontae Turpin don't want to see any of him until week one when they're gearing up to play the New York Giants so um there's that last question until we wrap things up who is your MVPN of PNVPFN? Say that 10 times fast. Who is that for you this week? It's Jalen Tolbert. Uh, seeing him be, I think, somebody who can be a legitimate number three wide receiver at the NFL level right now is huge for the Dallas Cowboys because I think that when you look at the landscape of their wide receiver room, you have that number one guy in CD lamb. And there's no questioning that I think Brandon cooks is still a lot better than a lot of people give him credit for. I think he's going to be massive for this offense. And then you're going to get a little bit of a different package between Jalen Tolbert and um, Michael Gallup. And I think if Michael Gallup has his explosiveness back that downfield passing ability or that downfield receiving ability that he has the ability to separate late around the sidelines and that unbelievable sideline awareness that he has and even when he was playing poorly last year when he didn't have that explosiveness anymore we still saw the side but we still saw the sideline shenanigans that he can bring to the game so i'm excited to have what i believe to be four legitimate receiving weapons on the outside paired with this tight end room paired with the running back group I think that this is an almost complete offense outside of offensive line depth. Man, you stole mine. I was going to go JT uh, as well, but all of your courses here, look, all of your courses, I'm, I'm willing to work on the spot here. It's okay. Uh, I had a backup because I had a feeling you were going to say JT anyways. My MVPFN for the week is going to really go Daddle. And again, this Good is one. a guy yeah. who has taken advantage of every opportunity he has gotten. You're, you're talking about a guy that's waited in the wings for four years, four years of his life to have this opportunity and knowing that he might not have it again if he doesn't show out. So for me, Rico Dowdle has done everything he needs to in his power to make this roster. He's been physical. He's been sticky. He's been fast. And more importantly, he's been coachable. He listens. He wants to be coached. He wants to learn and he grows just like that example I used earlier of, you know, me telling him in the locker room, Hey, we'll get a touchdown next week after, you know, the fumble. And then he does. I mean, really, this guy wants to be better, and that's the kind of guy you want on your team. I am so excited for Rico Dowdle. I think it's just a matter of time uh, until he's announced on the final roster. For me, he is the running back, too. But I also think you have a multiverse where you have Tony Pollard as your running back one, Rico Dowdle is running back two, and then you have a Deuce Vaughn as a running back two and a half. I don't even want to call him a three. I, I think two and a half. So you might have a one, two and a half punch uh, this year with the Dallas Cowboys running back room, which is really exciting. So with all of that, Dalton, we're out of time. This thing just flies by when we're having so much fun talking about all of this. I, I never realize how fast time goes by until we're talking about the Cowboys because it's just that much fun. You know, we're talking about uh, what's that saying? If you love what you're doing, it doesn't feel like work or something yeah. like that. That's, that's kind of the vibes uh, with this. But where can the people find you? Look, we were tweeting some uh, high school musical lyrics. So I think people should go tweet you some high school musical lyrics of their choice this week um, in honor of this last preseason game. Let's just all celebrate and let's just tweet Dalton's random high school musical lyrics. Where can they find you on social media to do that? Uh, if you want to send me high school musical lyrics, it is at Dalton B. Miller on Twitter. Uh, have fun with that, guys. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I could have said just Disney Channel songs in general, but I, I hate to specific. say this. My wife always makes fun of me, but I'm not a. Di- I wasn't a Disney kid. Like, were you a Nickelodeon kid? Yeah, I was a Nickelodeon kid. Oh my goodness! Yeah. No, yeah. Nickelodeon, Nickelodeon Cartoon, Cartoon, Cartoon Network Cartoon? over Disney for me. It was. Oh, yeah. you know, we yeah. made so much progress today with the whole cheese pie thing, and I feel like you just kind of took a step back uh, with that comment. I'm not. Look, I watched Nickelodeon. It was like Rugrats and Cat Dog, Hey Arnold, The Amanda Show. All of those things were fantastic. But I'm sorry, like Halloween Town and Cadet Kelly, Xenon, none of those. Like That's So Raven, Lizzie McGuire, The Proud Family, none of that. Wow. Guys, I'm disappointed. I don't know about y'all, but we're ending this podcast on a disappointing note because Dalton was a Nickelodeon kid. Uh, As for me, you can find me at Jess Navarro's underscore on Twitter and Instagram. We're going to be, I'm going to be back at the star uh, for training camp all week because the Dallas Cowboys are back and they have some open practices. So uh, I'll be there and very excited to get you guys more insight from the star as well. So with that, Thank you guys so much for joining us, Dalton. Thank you for being an amazing, incredible, fantastic, all the other, all the other good things in the world co-host, except for the whole Nickelodeon thing. I'm going to forget you said that. Um, it's always so fun doing this with you every week. But until next week, everybody, please stay safe. Have a fantastic day. And we will talk to you real soon.